Welcome back to the World Over. Pope Francis issued a new law on the liturgy this week. Will it change how the Mass is celebrated in your parish? And what are the Holy Fathers questioning President Trump's pro-life bona fides due to his immigration policy? And might Paul VI encyclical, Humanae Vitae, dealing with artificial contraception, be retooled? To analyze it all is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief at thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, and Father Gerald Murray, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York. Thank you all for being here in studio with me. I want to start with Monium Principium, which is the Pope's new motto proprio, an edict of the Church, dealing with liturgical translations. He dropped this on Saturday, and it, it, it makes a series of changes in canon law. Before we introduce people to what it actually says, why do this now, Robert Royal? That's a very good question, and I wish I had a very good answer for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what we can see basically is this is a further extension of what the Holy Father has done since he became Pope, and that is that he wants to reach out to the peripheries. He wants to invite bishops' conferences in various parts of the world to adapt the liturgy so that what is good in their languages and in their cultures can be brought into the, into the church. Mm -hmm. The danger, of course, of doing this is that the Catholic Church is a universal church. The, the name Catholic means universal. And in a time like ours, where there are so many polarizing elements, not only in the United States, but around the world, um, the danger of this is we may begin to see a kind of a dissolution of that unity and then bishops' conferences pulling in different directions. Well, we all remember the liturgical battles over translations, the vertical language, the inclusive language that Mother Angelica spent most of her public life battling. Um, these are things that happened in the not-too-distant future. Some look at this and think this might reignite those translation battles. Might they, Father Gerald Murray? Well, the new law that the Pope has written means that local bishops' conferences can now translate the Latin texts of uh, the liturgy and then uh, approve it and then send it to Rome for Rome's confirmation of that. So not Rome's adaptation or changes, but Well, the, the presumption in the new law is that if it's done locally, if it's faithful to the uh, text of the Latin, that it will get Roman approval. Now, the question is, what does fidelity mean? Is it creative fidelity or is it literal fidelity? And uh, how extensive will be the review of these translations by the Roman, by the uh, dicastery that deals with sacraments and worship? I want to read this canon to the audience and share it with you. We'll put it up on the screen. Here's what's changed. Canon 838, part two. It is for the apostolic see to order the sacred liturgy of the universal church, publish liturgical books, recognize, and here are the changes, adaptations approved by Episcopal conferences according to the norm of law, and exercise vigilance that liturgical regulations are observed faithfully everywhere. Going on, part three reads, it pertains to the Episcopal conferences to faithfully prepare versions of the liturgical books in vernacular languages suitably accommodated within defined limits and to approve and publish liturgical books for the regions for which they are responsible after the confirmation of the apostolic see. It seems to put a lot more of the power of translating the process back in the hands of the local bishops' conference. What is the problem with that from your perspective? Well, I think you're right that this is intended deliberately to decentralize uh, a good deal of the power that Rome has had about the liturgy. Um, my worry about all of this is that this is not a great time for translations in general. Uh, the mm -hmm. King James Bible is made roughly around the same time as Shakespeare exists. Mm. Translations, as we know since Vatican II of the liturgy, are sometimes painful, sometimes flat, uninspiring. Yeah. And the whole purpose of the liturgy, of course, is to worship God and to lead people to the divinity. So as we try to accommodate to people around the world, that's a good thing. We want them to be able to understand exactly what is happening in the Mass. But the mysteries of the faith are not easily translatable yeah. into vernaculars. Yeah. And so we have to be quite vigilant about exactly what we're doing. And we know from what happened after Vatican II that things can go very much yeah. awry. Father Jerry, at the very top of this document, it says, and I want to pick up on what Robert was saying, it says that this is all being done according to which liturgical prayer be accommodated 
to the comprehension of the people. The comprehension of the people is one of the benchmarks the Pope is setting forward here with this new adaptation of canon law. What does this mean to liturgium authenticum, Benedict XVI's rule and law, that liturgy translations adhere to the Latin and are faithful to it? And are the bishops equipped to translate these documents and precious texts in a proper way? Well, what it means, and for a number of reasons, uh, that we're entering into a new phase, I think, of liturgical battling. Because when Pope Benedict issued the latest English translation of the liturgy, it was received very well by most people. It was, in my opinion, it's a beautiful translation because yeah. it reflects the Latin. But it was based on a philosophical outlook, which said the Latin is normative, not only language wise, but theologically and for the history of the church. We are the Latin Rite Church, the Roman ritual. Mm. Uh, therefore, the translation should reflect the Latin as closely as possible. Now, philosophically, if a bishop's conference says, no, we want a, you know, vernacular that's in very common in ordinary English that's going to be immediately understandable right. by everyone well then a lot of theological concepts are going to get watered down or thrown out or ignored mm. that's a big problem well, let's say one word consubstantial yeah that used to be translated as one in being one in being has a different meaning than consubstantialis in Latin that was recognized by the revision that consubstantial was put mm -hmm. in it's a catechetical task for us priests to explain what it means to be of one of the same substance but now, if the whole thing is subject to retranslation, uh, we could have some disunion. I mean, you could have the bishops' conference in Africa right. say, we want a translation, the one in America, and then you could travel the world and find or five Canada. or six. Canada could want one. Um, you know, for the Latin liturgy of the one Roman church, there should be a unified translation which reflects the, the reality of what the Latin original says. I hope that that will be kept. Uh, Robert Royal, does this make the Catholic Church essentially a cafeteria institution where the liturgy is concerned? You might go to Canada and hear one translation. You might go to, to uh, B B Bermuda or, or, or the Bahamas and hear an entirely different translation. That's, that's the danger of course, here. And um, one of the things I, I was struck by when I began to read the document is right at the beginning it refers back to the document uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium of Vatican II, which is about the liturgy. It was the very first document that Vatican II pr produced. And it spoke in terms of accommodating. Now, in, in Latin, a language is Italian, and in Latin it means something a little bit different than just sort of dumbing down, which might be the danger, as Father mm -hmm. was just saying. But the thing that... that uh, you could say about that original document in Vatican II is that it, in addition to making the liturgy understandable by modern people who don't necessarily know Latin, it also encouraged bishops to bring up the level of the laity so that they could participate in Gregorian chant, they could understand the Latin liturgy. So it's a two-way street. The, the, the understanding isn't simply to reach people at the very lowest cultural level that happens to exist right. at this moment. It's also to, to bring people into that high understanding of the, the sacred mysteries that the church has developed. To elevate century. the mind and the soul. I always tell people this about Shakespeare. You wouldn't dare to change to be or not to be. That is the question, too. You think I should kill myself today? Eh, maybe not. You don't do that. So why do people feel free or have such a strong desire to dumb down what is supposed to be the most sacred, beautiful, universal prayer of the church? Well, we've got some philosophical differences here, and this basically comes down to the question, who's in charge here? Uh, is it the culture reigning at the moment? Is it the guardians of enlightened thinking? For instance, inclusive language. You know, when the translation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church came out originally, mm. it was going to be a gender-neutral type thing. It, the, the, the word man was banished. Fortunately, that was stopped, and the Catechism is accurate, in the translation we got. But there's a philosophy there uh, which says when Jesus said something regarding, you know, the man who leaves his wife or whatever, and then we can't, we can't see, be specific about man or woman, we have to speak in general, that's a philosophical thing. Philosophy underlies all translations, and, you know, the church, since we're the guardian of revelation, the philosophy has to be realism. 
what a word is in one language, find the closest equivalent and use it. Mm -hmm. Don't create a mm -hmm. whole new vocabulary because you say, well, people don't need to hear that stuff anymore. They don't know right. what it means. If they don't know what it means, it's an indictment you haven't taught them. Well, there, there were great cheers this week from some in the Catholic media, I use that term lightly, um, who were cheering this document, saying this will be a return. We can go back to the language we had in the 70s when everybody enjoyed what was said, knew all the responses, and it didn't feel funky in my mouth when I said, you know, uh, uh, th thank you for entering under the roof. You know, I'm not worthy that you should enter under the roof of my mouth. That's so awkward. People were tweeting this to me this week. Well, if you have a, a literary mind and you have a little uh, broader understanding of what's happening, first of all, that's a gospel quote from the scripture. Secondly, the roof of your mouth, like the roof of the centurion's house, has, has uh, allegorical meaning that if you reflect on it, it means something deeper and can. What is really at play here and what does this mean to the Roman liturgy? Well, if you took the document as written, just literally as written, there are all, any number of phrases that are safeguards, you know, uh, fidelity to the Latin, unity of the yeah, Who's going to ensure that? that? All they're saying here is you need a confirmation of the Holy See. And the Holy See should not be considered as an alternative intervention in the process of translation. That's what Benedict XVI was all about. Yeah, I think we, we can say with a great degree of confidence that if some highly rigid and esoteric translation were to appear, Rome might not be so hands-off about what, what appears there. there. There must be some way of, of maintaining the, the universality. But look, I want to go back to this point. This, this is a time in history when our culture is very horizontal. Um, it's almost the case, I mean, to quote Shakespeare, is, it sounds so unreal to, to many people. And of course, that's a problem in, in terms of evangelizing even the Catholic people. But there have to, has to be a double process going on here. At the same time that we're, we're reaching out to people and accompanying them and, and, and trying to bring them into the, the faith, we also have to elevate them. I mean, the, the, church, the greatest role that the church can play at this moment through its, its spiritual teachings, its moral teachings, its, its social outreach is to elevate the society in which we live, which is very pragmatic and very sort of pedestrian. I want to remind you all of something. We can come back to this if we have time. Uh, this all came out, this revision in the liturgy, came out of a commission that the Pope appointed to study the translations and how they were formed. Now we have reports of another commission that has been appointed as the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae, a landmark encyclical, Paul VI, that uh, defined the teaching on artificial contraceptives and to the eyes of many was a prophetic document. Now that too is being studied. Might this lead to a reimagining, retooling, or changes of the teaching we see in Humanae Vitae? Father Jerry. We can only pray no. Now we have to face it. There's a relentless pressure outside and inside the church to discard Humanae Vitae. And it was one of the missions of Pope John Paul II in his pontificate to preach uh, the value of the church's teaching as regards the immorality of artificial contraception. Mm. To form a commission, which by the way was kind of a, is called a study group, yep. and it was, it's been revealed by journalists, there's been no announcement of it, that's kind of very worrying. Uh, we don't, I, in my opinion, we don't need to restudy uh, Humanae Vitae. We need to teach it in the first place because Humanae Vitae was not in Pope Paul VI making something up. It was a reaffirmation of perennial church teaching based on the understanding that new means of contraception are not any, in any way allowable because they're ana analyzed by the same reality of creation. Mm -hmm. God made man and woman and they're fertile and fertility is a gift from God must be respected. If there's any hint that there's going to be any change on this coming out of this commission, uh, we're in for a very, very big storm. Well, the, it, I, I think we've got more than a hint. Um, the commission's, uh, the leader of the commission, one of the members of the commission, a Monsignor Marengo, in an interview in July, said, quote, Humanae Vitae must be placed in the context of everything important and fruitful in the church and that the church has said on marriage and the family during these last 50 years. That means what to you? And might this be more of, to quote this liturgical document, accommodating the comprehension of the people, Robert Royal? Yeah, Vatican officials have been playing down this. In fact, they, they denied that there was a commission on Humanae Vitae in, in existence mm -hmm. for quite a while. But um, it's clear from other reports that we have that this 
Shadow Commission is being given access to all the files having to do with Humane Vitae. Secret this is, archives. This is quite extraordinary. Yeah. And what the benefit of this is going to be is very hard to see because, look, as with the liturgy, large percentages of Catholics are not in church on Sunday, don't respect Catholic teaching about contraception. If you wanted to be popular with these people, you could just abolish the Sunday requirements and, and say, fine, you know, contraception is fine. Whether that would really bring anybody back into the church, whether it would elevate anything, is very, very doubtful. And as with Amoris Laetitia, the attempts to, to restrict these so-called small pastoral changes, that there are circumstances in which mm -hmm. things that have been regarded always as, Im as absolutely uh, immoral in the church can be mm -hmm. kind of accommodated and, or maybe are even what God wants. I, I think that this is going to create a confusion and actually a flight from the church. I hear it. You probably mm -hmm. do, too. I hear it from people who are readers of mine. Father Gerald Murray, uh, I, I, when I read this, the alarm bells, the, my Amoris Laetitia alarm bells go off, and I start hearing the same cries for change, a drumbeat of commissions and analysis, and people pressuring the Pope to do something. What we saw in Amoris Laetitia, it has provoked confusion, whatever is there. And I think we're getting a better picture of what the intention was on marriage and family. If, why have a study like this if you're not going to fundamentally change the teaching? Well, the thing is, Pope Francis has reaffirmed uh, Humanae Vitae and spoken, speaking about Pope Paul he VI, and he said how he was prophetic and heroic in doing it. So the Pope has not personally qu questioned Humanae Vitae at all. The question is, though, what pressures does he listen to? Right. You know, there are always discordant voices. We know that this theological dissent on Humanae Vitae has been a cancer in the church for 50 years. Uh, so if the commission is out there to study and explain better to people why they must adhere to this teaching, then I'm all for it. But, you know, there's an old kind of Washington principle. You know, commissions get formed. The results are already determined before they're formed, but then it, they serve as kind of a buffer zone. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not the case here, but, you know, I'm not happy when I don't hear prominent defenders of Humanae Vitae being on a committee like this. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be something to worry about. I've got to shift to another topic. When the Pope was on his plane back from Colombia, he was pulled into a question on DACA, that deferred action against refugees who are already here, uh, young immigrants, uh, that President Obama drafted up, many say, without the constitutional authority to do so. President Trump has since rescinded DACA and said, I'm going to give Congress six months to find a real lasting solution for these people and a way to save them. But it's up to Congress to do that. The Pope questioned the president's pro-life bona fides. And he says, if U.S. President Donald Trump considers himself pro-life, he should reconsider his decision to end a program that allows the children of undocumented immigrants to remain in the United States. The Pope's point being, family unity is paramount, and this is part of the pro-life mission. Your reaction to this? Yeah, I, I think the Holy Father was cautious. I was surprised at how cautious he was in actually the way he spoke about this, although that outtake that you just had sounds, sounds very striking. I think what he doesn't understand is what you were getting at, is this is a constitutional question. Right. It was President Obama who did this unilaterally outside the constitutional structures because it is up to Congress to make decisions about immigration policy in the United States. So in a, in a sense, although obviously President Trump wants to restrict certain types of immigration, in a sense, what he's doing is simply saying we're going to revert to the constitutional procedures and order that are supposed to be followed. But I don't think that the Holy Father understood that so much. He, he always affirms uh, openness to immigration, sure. refugees, et cetera. And I, I think that's mostly what he was hearing when he, he was questioned. And, and I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. Father Jerry, the larger question is, have you ever seen a pope challenge someone on their pro-life credentials using what is an issue that isn't directly related to abortion or the procurement of abortion? And the truth of the matter is, Trump has a pretty good record on, on, this, on this column. Well, you know, I'm very grateful that he appointed a pro-life justice to the Supreme Court, and I'm very grateful that this administration is doing what they can to promote at lower levels in the, uh, in the justice system the pro-life mission 
or the pro-life reality, let me put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, some people, I think the Pope would fall into that, would include pro-life issues to be beyond simply abortion, euthanasia, mercy killing, and all the things right. that are most grave threats. And I agree with him to a certain extent, but I agree with Bob when it comes to a question of law and how you resolve a dispute regarding immigration, it's not as immediately evident that you're anti-pro-life if you say the solution to immigration must come from Congress, not the president. In his defense, the Pope said he did not study the DACA issue, and I, right. I believe him. Yes. Um, let's look at this other quote. This is uh, about climate change. Also, on the plane home, the Pope says here, whoever denies it climate change has to go to the scientists and ask them. They speak very clearly. Scientists are precise. Then they decide, and history will judge those decisions. He also said it reminded him of the psalm where man just is stupid and won't listen. Again, are we elevating prudential judgments and side issues to the level of clear moral teaching of the Catholic Church? Well, this pope has made it very clear that he's on board with even the most radical environmental claims. We all remember the famous passage in Laudato Si where he says, <laughs> using air conditioners, Turn your air conditioner is, off. is a, sort of a bad thing. Um, I don't mind him weighing in and saying that we ought to be careful about creation. When we start to get down to the specifics, um, you know, there are some people who think that the recent hurricanes that hit uh, the United right. States are the result of, of climate change. They aren't. No scientist will tell you that there's a direct connection from one to, to the other. Mm -hmm. So uh, he sh it's fine for him to affirm care for creation. That's, mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, the, the policies have to take a lot of different things into account. And if we are going to allow people to re remain in poverty because we're too restrictive in our, our economic activities, well, then we see that there's actually a balance in, in terms of mm -hmm. protecting the creation. We also have to protect the human creation. Yeah. The, Father Jerry, the final yeah, word on yeah, that. Yeah, on that, absolutely. We should listen to scientists, but not every scientist agrees that man-made climate change is a reality to the extent that it uh, requires uh, massive restructuring of the human economy that we have in the world. So, uh, yeah, I think the Pope, as Bob says, he has a contribution to make, but the hopeful thing is, the helpful thing would be if all scientists were able to po to be heard and participate in that discussion. Final topic, these Belgian brothers who own hospitals, they had had a policy of accommodating euthanasia in their hospitals. They were disciplined by their bishop, the Holy See. The Pope said, you can't do this. This week they come out and said, we have to do it. We have to make all the medical treatments available. What should the papal reaction be and the Holy See's reaction? Uh, these brothers either change immediately or they should all be suspended and their hospitals should be declared non-Catholic. This is not a joke, and this is really infuriating that people can pretend to be serving the interests of the Catholic Church and the teaching of Christ while having their patients killed in their facility by doctors. The Nazis did precisely that. The Nazis practiced euthanasia on people under the guise of having doctors do it. Now, these brothers, it's unbelievable that these brothers would consider that they're doing the will of Christ. This is a corrupt organization if they don't change. Robert. I'm going to quote my, the Holy Father. I haven't studied this issue. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I read in the recent news reports and analyses that actually the, the brothers are resisting the board, which is a lay board. Right. The, the lay board kind of re, has just said, no, we're not going to follow mm -hmm. Rome's lead. And the, the head of the, uh, of the order has said that he is against euthanasia. So I think we're going to have to see a little bit more how this plays out. But I think Father is exactly right. You cannot have people calling themselves Catholic killing innocent human beings. Papal Posse, thank you both for being here. Robert Royal and Father Jerry Murray's commentary are at catholicthing.org.